Percy Bysshe Shelley's Ozymandias is one of those romantic poems that everybody seems to know somehow. It uh, recurs many, in many different places in popular culture, for example. Uh, and one reason, I think, for this is that it, it seems to be a very straightforward poem about a very simple universal theme, the insignificance of humanity in the face of time. Uh, on the most basic level, a paraphrase of the action can be made quite simply. A traveler reports on seeing a dismembered statue in the desert with an inscription that claims this is a statue of an all-powerful king, but this broken statue is the only reminder of his existence. Uh, the obvious irony that is the point of this poem is not difficult to detect. The traveler describes a ruined statue with the inscription, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Uh, clearly, this statement is rendered ironic by the ravages of time that the statue has been subjected to. It has become an empty threat, giving the sense of a ridiculously inflated sense of self-importance. So the basic moral of the poem is a warning against human pride and earthly power. Uh, as in a, a poem like Mont Blanc, uh, there is, we see that there's a much greater power than the human at work in nature. In short, then, the obvious point of the poem is a reflection on humanity's sense of self-importance. Even the most impressive human accomplishments are transient, so we just need to get over ourselves. But is there anything more to be said about this poem? Well, for one thing, we, we can see a certain amount of added in, interest studying it in as we are in the context of the Romantic period, uh, as we can see that it takes part in a number of important discourses of this period. Uh, first of all, it expresses a typically Romantic anxiety about the past, uh, which we might see uh, paralleled in Henry Fusley's painting, uh, The Artist in Despair Over the Magnitude of Antique Fragments. Uh, in, in this painting, we see at the bottom of the screen uh, the, the artist uh, with one hand on the giant foot and one, one hand uh, covering his or her head. Uh, and we see we see the, the the artist being dwarfed by this giant foot and hand. Uh, so in some ways, the poem seems to reenact this scenario, describing the magnitude of fragments from an antique land. And yet, what this poem lacks is any sense of the speaker's response to the traveler. Does this story make the speaker bury his head in his hands, like the figure in the painting, or does it provoke some other reaction? We don't know, because the poem ends with the closing of the quotation marks. So the poem doesn't offer any explicit judgment. Anything we might infer from the poem is implicit in what the traveler has reported. Along with this anxiety and fascination with the past is an anxiety and fascination with the foreign. The Romantic period saw a great deal of expansion of British interests in other parts of the world, so travel literature was a very popular form of writing, uh, and there was a great desire to know about other places, even as there was a simultaneous fear of them. So, just as Romanticism's relationship to the past is conflicted by its admiration of its accomplishments and fear, uh, admiration of the past accomplishments and fear at its barbarism, uh, so too is there a conflicted relation to other parts of the world, which were both seen as marvelous, uh, but often uh, appeared barbarous to the English point of view. Uh, this poem also addresses a typically romantic and particularly Shelleyan concern with tyranny. Ozymandias appears to have been a threatening, tyrannical figure, uh, but Shelley's poem suggests that tyranny will have an end, that the force of the natural course of things will undo all claims to human power. The poem thus invites a consideration of whether all human works, including the poem itself, are necessarily subject to the fate, the same fate as Ozymandias. How does the poem itself relate to this question of earthly power? 
A formal analysis of the poem might help us to address this question. Uh, first of all, we can see that it's a sonnet, uh, but what kind of sonnet is it supposed to be? Uh, it does not appear to be any clear kind of sonnet. Uh, Shelley is messing with the conventions of both the Shakespearean and the Petrarchan models. Uh, it starts ABAB as a Shakespearean sonnet might, uh, using an off rhyme of stone and frown, but then it, it goes ACDC, EDEF, uh, EF. E, e, uh, so what effect does all this achieve? Uh, first of all, it doesn't block off the poem into chunks of four or eight lines where we have kind of distinct uh, sections of the poem. Rather, everything interweaves and flows, uh, which is also um, also achieved by the enjambment uh, that, that Shelley uses throughout the poem. Uh, this might be a reflection on the power of time. The poem is constantly making us remember back to previous lines. Perhaps then the poem embodies this lack of human control over time. The poem itself resists any artificially fixed structure just as the lone and level sands resist Ozymandias' imposition of power. Moreover, the poem seems to speak to a romantic concern about the power and value of art. Uh, it is significant that it is specifically a sculpture that is used to emblematize the decay of civilization. The traveler calls attention to the skill of the sculpture, which is itself also subject to the ravages of time. Uh, so, what relationship does the poem suggest might have existed between the sculptor and Ozymandias? Um, <coughs> there are clues in this poem that suggest that the sculptor saw Ozymandias for what he was, a tyrant. So, uh, the, we see that he has a, sh the, a, a frown, a wrinkled lip, a sneer of cold command. Uh, all of which speak to the tyranny of Ozymandias, but also to the ability of the, the sculptor to read that tyranny, uh, as, as is indicated in the next line. Tell that it's sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. So, Ozymandias's power does not survive, but the, the way in which the sculptor has represented Ozymandias does survive. Does that change the way we read the poem? Uh, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Uh, mocked in this sense is perhaps a Shellian term for imitated, but certainly has the added connotation of mockery. Uh, so again, the sculptor uh, in, in depicting Ozymandias in perhaps a realistic way is still, in a sense, mocking him by doing so, by making his tear tyranny clear in the sculpture. And if all of that is true, then doesn't it suggest that something about the relation between art and, and power, that the sculptor's image of Ozymandias outlives Ozymandias himself, even if it remains broken in the desert? Uh, is art then to be seen as an exception or a partial exception to the power of time to destroy all human works? The final irony of the poem then is that the, the words inscribed on the pedestal may be taken as instead as being directed by time to Ozymandias and to the human race in general. It is we who should despair in the face of this overwhelming evidence of the power of time. And one final question to, that this poem raises is, does the poem itself disprove this claim with its own existence? Like the sculptor who has immortalized Ozymandias despite himself, has this poem uh, also immortalized the, 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 the lesson, the universal, as Shelley might say, uh, that, that, it is, uh, that, that it communicates uh, in, in, in this, its poetic form.